What I always loved about Advancing Black Pathways, just the name of it, is that it was very tactical and very intentional around black people and making sure that their pathway to financial success was clear and helping them make their way down that path. I'm most proud of the progress that we've made and the intentionality in 2019. It really highlighted that we could make an impact by engaging our community, engaging partners, and focusing on what really matters for African Americans. Advancing Black Pathways is focused on strengthening the economic foundation of the black community by investing in education. The role that education plays in creating wealth in the black community actually starts by leveling the playing field. It's gonna close the racial wealth gap in America by putting students on a pathway on careers that they would not have otherwise been exposed to. Our goal is really to change the way African Americans live to ensure that they are building wealth and assets. We want to see more African Americans not only moving into the middle class, but owning homes, creating jobs, creating opportunities for people within the community. And I think this opportunity with Advancing Black Pathways will lead into that in a very positive way. Everyone sees this as a seminal moment where we can actually move the needle to create more inclusive growth. I just feel really excited about the opportunity that's ahead of us. Today, Don and I are covering one of the most fundamental steps to creating a rewarding life, both during and after college, and that's understanding the state of your financial health. So, Don, it's always good to see you. We don't do this in person anymore, so we'll kick off this remote virtual conversation. So if you could talk to our audience here about your career journey, you know, where you went to school, how you landed your current role, and just give them a background on who you are. I began my career after graduating at Howard University in Washington, D.C., where I majored in information systems. I've had a long career in financial services across a number of different products and businesses. I was an investment banker, a corporate banker, and obviously now in the consumer bank. I did go back and get my master's in business administration from the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School, where I majored in both strategy and finance. And I'm fortunate I get to do both of those things here at J.P. Morgan Chase. Now, just a quick question. If I were to say HU, what would the response be? You know. All right. That's that Howard University call and response. And one thing I'll say, too, before we get started, uh, Don and I actually worked at another company together uh, before this. And so, again, students, you'll see a theme here that you build these relationships coming out of college and your paths can intersect throughout your career. For many new graduates entering the workforce, the first job after school is probably that first time you're getting that steady paycheck but it's also the first time that you're managing various expenses like rent, uh, student loan payments, uh, car payments, et cetera. So it can be overwhelming. So for that new graduate starting that first job, like what, what should they do? Where should they start? I would say start by keeping it very simple and it's about having a budget. And that budget can be in four parts. Know how much you make, know how much you have to spend, your rent, your utilities, your cell phone, then know how much is your discretionary. You worked really hard to get to this point, so you should enjoy some of your money, which means that you'll probably hang out with friends, and when we can, you'll travel. But the most important part, the fourth part, savings. Make sure you create an opportunity to save. Even if you can only save a little, your future you will be so glad that your current you hooked you up that way. Oh, that's great. I, I like that. And are there any tips or tools around savings, by the way, since you mentioned that? One of the best things that we offer here at J.P. Morgan Chase is autosave. It is the easiest set it and forget it tool that you can find. Gives you the opportunity to save money periodically as you set it or payday when you get paid. And we know that 80 percent of Americans have struggles saving money and managing paycheck to paycheck. So carving out a little bit, every paycheck can help. And if that's too hard, we've tried to make it so easy, you can save as little as a dollar a day. And when we know that half of Americans struggle to keep $400 in savings on a regular basis to withstand life's little emergencies, a leaky faucet, a blown tire, 
that dollar a day for 365 days gets you pretty close. No, that's, that's a great point. And so we're thinking about the, the students uh, and so cost of living. So I finished college, right? I was living in, I'm gonna make this up, Dallas. Now I'm yeah. moving to Manhattan. How do I factor in the cost of living as I think about building my budget? Just don't forget the little things, right? It's easy to not factor in transportation, lunch, certainly housing. Different parts of the country will have different costs of living. A one bedroom in Manhattan will be a lot more than a one bedroom in Dallas. But in Dallas, you may have to drive and have gas expense, whereas in New York, you may end up walking to work. So just consider how you live and how you work and try to find those hidden savings along the way and just make sure you keep that budget like I mentioned and stay on track. And don't be afraid that if you fall off track, just get back on. So you mentioned early on that many Americans don't have that emergency fund. Many people refer to it as a rainy day fund. So as these students now graduates are starting off in their careers, like how much should they have saved in terms of monthly expenses in that rainy day fund? I start off first by saying, think about what your monthly expenses are and make sure that you can always cover at least a month worth of expenses in, just in case. I already mentioned that most Americans, half of Americans don't have $400 in savings for those emergencies that come up from time to time. So you for sure want to at least meet that minimum threshold, but I'm more of a conservative guy. And so I think about having at least a month's worth of my rent, my utilities, my cell phone, the things I mentioned before, just to make sure in case you know there are tough times and we're experiencing some of that right now. There are people who didn't expect to be out of work, and they're very grateful that they did have that emergency savings fund. And I imagine as you know, these students are starting off, you have to actually build those reserves. So build that month, and then as you go further in your career, it's two, three more months, or depending on your expenses. But it brings up this whole concept of short-term savings versus longer-term savings. So can you tell me the importance of having a vision for both the short term, uh, which is maybe that rainy day fund, and the longer term, saving for whether it's retirement or something else, uh, car, house, et cetera? Well, you hit it right there, Sekou. It is really all about goals and setting goals and knowing where you want to be for the long term. For the true long term, it's about retirement. You want to be able to retire comfortably and with dignity. Right? You want to be able to enjoy and maintain a certain lifestyle that you will hopefully continue to grow into over the course of your life and your career. Along the way, you may want to buy a house, perhaps buy a car. You may even start a family. So it's important to start thinking about those things even now. It's one of those things where you wish someone had shared with you, like these little tips, these little kernels, these nuggets of information. You don't have to wait until there is a significant other in your life for you to be a homeowner. You don't have to wait until that family arrives to start saving for them. You can start doing that now. And then from a short-term goals perspective, as I mentioned before, you've worked hard, you should enjoy it. I'm sure you'll wanna go on vacation. You may wanna do something nice for those people who have supported you that helps you get this far. Maybe this is the time to really treat your parents or that caregiver who was so nice to you and supported you along the way. Those are the types of goals I'm talking about. And I think it's important to always maintain that line of sight for each one of those, short, medium, and long, and then put a little bit aside for each one of those. But like I said, it's also important to enjoy you know, the fruits of your labor. So yeah, go ahead and take that vacation. It makes you feel comfortable when you know you've got that money set aside as well for your retirement. You mentioned enjoying the fruits of your labor. I remember... Uh, when I moved to New York City out of graduate school uh, in North Carolina, and I, this is somewhat uh, that cost of living discussion, but I got my salary and I was like, oh, yes. And then I started paying rent and I'm like, oh, no. Uh, and so <laughs> the challenge was, OK, how do I then prioritize you know, now having this expensive rent, et cetera? So what would you say in terms of like how I break down or how these graduates should break down? that budget? Like, are there any tips or the way you should think about the prioritization of your expenses? You know, it is about being practical. You know, so for me, being practical recognizes that you as a graduate 
you know, perhaps living in a new city that you do want to enjoy your life. So I'm not going to, you know, skirt over that. But if you're practical, then you'll say to yourself, you know what, I can't spend it all, right? And if I take these tips that Sekou and Don are sharing with me, I'll think a little bit more about my medium term goals and my longer term goals. And I'll sign up for that 401k today and I'll make that a priority. But there's another word that's really important, quite honestly, and it's sacrifice. So Sekou, when you talked about graduating from undergrad, it made me think about my time graduating from Howard University. And for me, it really was about sacrifice. I just didn't go out as much as I could have. I didn't buy as much gear as much as I could have because I was very focused on paying down my debt. That was super important to me. I didn't want to be in student loan debt forever, but I also was thinking about my long-term and retirement, and I made sure to contribute to my 401k. I will tell you that now, the, the me now is very glad for the me back then that put that money aside. It just means that I have more peace of mind and I have more security for my family. I'm glad you brought up retirement. I'll share a personal story there around my 401k. So first job out of graduate school, uh, I was basically trying to make sure I can make all the rent payments and student loans, et cetera. And I said, you know what? Let me not invest in this 401k. Like, I'm not retiring anytime soon. And fortunately, I had someone say to me, no, you're getting a dollar for dollar match. And to your point, the me of today, I worked at that company for five years and have since rolled that 401k over the amount, the amount of increase uh, in that money, the power of compounding really has made a tremendous difference. And so that's great that, that again, your journey as well. Sometimes we may want to make a short term decision that has longer term implications. So it's great to hear that you emphasize that for students because starting retirement is important now. But let's talk about the here and now and one thing that will impact my ability to get a car, to buy a home, et cetera, and that is credit. So what will you, what can you tell us to deconstruct how your credit score is calculated or what are some of the things that we should be mindful of as we think about our credit? I'm so glad you asked that question. It is sometimes the biggest pitfall that hits students, hits graduates, and quite honestly, hits adults throughout the course of their life. And most folks are not as educated or as thoughtful about their credit as they could be. It really comes down to four basic parts. How long is your credit history? Do you pay your bills on time? How much overall credit do you have? And what's your utilization? There are other factors as well, like how many times you will apply for credit. But I'm going to focus on the things that you can control, which is paying your bills on time. At a minimum, make the minimum payment. Make that one of your practical priorities. Make that one of your practical sacrifices. Now, of course, you are way better off when you can pay your bills in full. There's a lot of folks who will say, if you can't save it, then you shouldn't spend it. And it's also, if you can't pay it off, then you shouldn't spend it. So just be smart about your budget. Don't overextend. And don't think, well, I've got this big credit line, so I can use up a bunch of it. That really hurts you. And particularly when you're trying to get something that you really want, a house or a car, it will be so much more expensive for you because you didn't practice good credit habits. And that's a great point you raise, and that is your interest rates are correlated to your uh, credit score. And I'm glad you broke down those four components because, you know, Sometimes people just don't know. So if you're about to buy a home and you're in that department store and they say, do you want to save 10 percent? Well, if you're about to buy by opening a department store credit, if you're about to buy a home, that answer is probably no. And so that, that's helpful to hear how important credit is. But if you can you know, go deeper there. So you said the length of time that you've had credit. So as a new graduate, obviously I'm going to be building credit. So what's, uh, what are some of the things I should do as I build credit? Some of the best ways that you can build credit is to just be smart about the credit that you take on. So these days you're going to have a credit card, just don't overextend, right? You don't need perhaps the biggest line. And if you get it, just be smart about it. What's also helpful is your student loans. And if you can afford it and you choose to buy a home early or buy an apartment, Having a mortgage is also great credit to have 
demonstrates great borrowing skills. We have a great tool here at JP Morgan Chase called Credit Journey. I would highly encourage you to enroll and that will help you stay on track. We'll also give you good tips along the way in terms of what are the right levers that you should be pulling to get to the highest credit score you can. Better believe you can keep a 700 plus. Yes, and keep it 700 plus. My joke there is uh, our generation, we used to say keeping it 100, that meant keeping it real. But this era, you have to keep it 700 plus. So uh, that, again, is your credit score. And let's talk more about uh, the credit score. One, I want to say credit journey is free. You don't have to be a customer. Anyone uh, can sign up. But sometimes I, I think people don't understand more of the components. So if you mentioned balances. So if I have a credit card with $5,000 limit and owe 4,000 versus a credit card with a thousand dollar limit and owe 200, what scenario would give me the better credit score and, and why? Well, it's a great question, Seku. And what I would say is, look, everyone's relationship with money is different. What's important to do is to make the best decisions that you can. Look at the interest rate that you're paying. Maybe it's important to pay down the credit with the highest interest rate because it's costing you the most. But also in the example that you gave, look at your utilization. Do you have an opportunity to pay down on the higher used card? So that way in balance, your credit score hopefully will take into account favorably that you're not overextending on either one of those cards. But keep in mind the point on, on interest rates because that does cost you money. What I like to say too, and I go back to the well on this, it is about sacrifice. If you find yourself in a position and maybe you have overextend yourself a little bit, and in the example, you have one card where you're maybe not using a lot, but it's costing you a lot. And in the other card, it's not costing you that much, but you are highly utilized on that card. It just means a little bit more sacrifice for the short term. And part of goal setting is saying, where do I want to be versus where I am? And for the next six months, what can I do to improve my position? Maybe it means that I don't do some things that I like to do or I don't buy some things that I like to buy, but nothing feels better than being debt-free and managing your debt to a comfortable place. Now, that, that's a great point. And I think spending habits have changed for many people in this COVID-19 era where you realize, again, I used to get cuts uh, maybe weekly now. It, it's been more of a every two months uh, uh, endeavor. Uh, but how can the, the students and graduates really take into account some of those habits and, and build it into a budget? So you talk about like looking at and being responsible, but, but like as I break down at, at the base level, like should I set goals around entertainment, goals around going like what, what types of goals should we think about you know, as we, we, we look at our holistic balance sheet? I will tell you the first thing that me and my family did with COVID is say, we're no longer commuting to work. We're no longer buying lunches. How much money can we save? And we didn't just leave it in the checking. We were intentional. And every two weeks, we would look at our budget and we would say, what's the dollars that we're saving? Because we're not doing certain things anymore. We're not dining out. And like I said, we're not commuting. We're not buying lunch. And we intentionally would then move it to savings. And we have two children at home, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and we put more into their 529 plans. It is really about managing your finances as an activity, making it an active part of your everyday life and taking advantage of those moments, taking advantage when, hey, you know what? I didn't spend that $10 this week that I spent last week. Don't just let it sit there. It will ultimately find its way to getting spent move it, be intentional. And if you have those goals where you know you're trying to chip away at something or you're trying to build something, like I said, there is no greater reward than seeing your chip away or seeing your build up. Yeah, I, I like that concept. And I've heard you say before, it's not what you make, it's what you keep and grow. So, you know, that seems to embody that. But for, for those out there, explain that statement. That's a great question, Sekou, I'm so glad you asked that. And I know for our graduates, you're just on the cusp of beginning your career, so there's going to likely be great income appreciation for you. But one of life's best lessons learned for me came from my mom, who is an essential worker. And as a nurse, 
her income didn't appreciate. It stayed the same. But she did a great job as an immigrant raising me and my two sisters. And so we never had to worry about food on the table or lights in the house. But most importantly, when it was time for us to get our education, like we saw firsthand what sacrifice and savings could yield. It meant that our life's pursuits and our life's dreams could be fulfilled because she made the sacrifice based on what she made and what she kept to then pay it forward to us. Thank you for sharing that uh, very personal example. And now that really leads me to a, a bigger point about savings and building toward a financial future. But the reality that there have been several factors that have made that a bit more challenging for Black communities. If you think about it, nearly one fifth of Black households are unbanked. Uh, and when you look at the median net worth of a Black family, it's 17,000 versus 171,000 for a white family. So why is it that so many Black Americans have had challenges around that financial health? So what, what structural factors have led us to this point? Hey, Sekou, that is a great question, and thank you for asking it. Obviously, it's one that's deeply personal and cuts right at the heart who a lot of us are. I think structurally, some of the challenges that we have faced is access, exposure, and education. And even when I look at you and I look at me, and here we are at J.P. Morgan Chase, I've known you for a long time, and I know what your hustle has been. I know that you have been persistent, right, and you have therefore persevered. And so... So when I think about folks from black and brown communities, big challenge sometimes is not knowing where to go to get good guidance and good advice. And sometimes having the role model that says, you can do more, you can be more. And that's why I'm proud when I see you in this role, I'm proud of the work that we do here at Advancing Black Pathways to really create all of these paths of opportunity. We are creating that exposure element. We are giving folks the education. And it's not just students. It's not just graduates. It's everyday people. It actually even goes beyond black and brown communities. That is sometimes the biggest challenge is that you just don't know. And that's why I'm glad we're even doing this today, because there's going to be some tips that someone hadn't thought about. There's going to be something in here about sacrifice or being practical or prioritizing that maybe they just didn't consider. And sometimes it can be as simple as that. I don't want to diminish the challenges that come from being in being born and being bred in black and brown communities. But I focus, like I said, on the things that I can control. And the things that I can control is what do I know and what actions do I take? Yeah, I, I agree that, you know, with the immense uh, opportunity uh, that these students will have, they will be able to do more than the generations before them. I think those structural challenges, whether it's been less income passed on, whether it's been less capital in the community, et cetera. Uh, I think that's why we're doing what we're doing. I agree with you with Advancing Black Pathways and financial health uh, so that we can ensure that this next generation is really able to do more than we've even dreamed of. And so, so I appreciate you in playing your role as that general manager of our financial health to ensure that whether it's the tools, the tips, the access to banking, is, is available for all. Well, Don, our time is almost up. So I want to see if you had any other calls to action as our graduates now are full of insight, but what other thing would you leave them with as they start their journey? First, let me start off by saying how proud we are of you, both Sekou and I, for your journey, especially during these times. It's been difficult for a lot of us, but it's been particularly difficult for you, given this is where you're starting off but I'm so glad that you're persevering. And we know, both of us, that you will continue to persist to reach your goals. And I'm so glad that we had this opportunity to talk to you about setting goals, because your goals are gonna be both personal and professional and financial. So some simple calls to action to remember. We talked about them throughout the course of our conversation. Start saving, just get started, it's simple. Make that behavior a habit. We have a great tool. You can use it, autosave, and as I mentioned, as little as a dollar a day. Two, credit journey. Sign up now. Know what your score is. Like, do you know your score? Are you keeping it 700 plus? Make sure you can get to the highest number you can 
and stay there. Make it a game. And three, start your budget. Figure out what your income and your expenses are. And we have another great tool, Budget Builder. It's pretty simple, pretty easy, and allows you to put it into the buckets that we mentioned so you can better manage your day-to-day finances. And I'll leave you, bonus, one more. Be committed to excellence. We talked about coming from black and brown communities. We talked about the sacrifices that we've made and the sacrifices that those who have supported us have made. Be committed to excellence. Thanks again, Don, for providing these insights and tools and tips for navigating your financial health after college. And while every financial journey may look different, it's important to start taking steps today to build towards your financial future where you can. Whether that's saving, whether that's putting together a budget, the steps you take now will benefit you for your lifetime. So be sure to tune in for our next session of the ABP Career Readiness Series on August 4th. Gerard Parchman, our Global Head of Banker Support, will discuss how banking has evolved in our digital age and share tips on for how you can explore a career in virtual banking. Register now at www.jpmorganchase.com forward slash ABP careers. Look forward to seeing you for our next episode. Thank you.